On a cold night in December 1980, a triangular craft landed in Rendlesham Forest. U.S. Air Force personnel from nearby Bentwaters and Woodbridge went to investigate the forest. Jim Penston encountered the strange craft. I noticed that there was an inscription on the side of the uh, aircraft. I was expecting to find, uh, I don't know, USAF, uh, something like that. There was this feeling of being drawn into it or being pulled into it. Like someone was holding a picture of, of zeros and ones in my mind's eye. That he said began to transmit binary code inside his head. I don't doubt Jim's personal experience, but it begs an answer to a very big question. Hey, and welcome back. Why would aliens use binary code? A system of counting adopted by IBM to get round the cost of building mechanical calculating machines. The universe is vast bigger than we can imagine. Even our galaxy is huge. Statistically, an alien visitor would have to travel for thousands of years, even at near light speed, to visit Earth, to get here even with a one-way ticket, never mind get home. But maybe they are so advanced, they know how to bend space and time. So why would a technologically advanced race to communicate in a mathematical language used by a firm trying to build a cheaper mechanical calculator? That is the type of big question I enjoy asking for you. I will try and answer it later, but first let's dive in to how humans count. It seems that base 10 counting emerged independent of cultural differences all over our planet. Many numeral systems of ancient civilizations use 10 and its powers representing numbers, possibly because there are 10 fingers on two hands and people started counting using their fingers. Examples of base 10 counting are in Egyptian numerals, Brahmi numerals, Greek numerals, Hebrew numerals, Roman numerals, and even Chinese numerals. But interestingly, possibly the Mayans and the Aztecs counted in base 20. The theory goes that they also counted their toes. Of course, that wouldn't work in England, where we wear socks and crocs. But holding up your fingers to order pints of beer in a noisy pub still works. But there's a secret number that even predates men with socks wearing Crocs, and that's the number 13. In the painted caves of southern France, here where I live, and in Spain, ancient humans represented animals. Today we have forgotten that animals were the dominant species on planet Earth, not humans. There were billions of orcs, an extinct type of cow. Humans knew their place. Animals were their source of food and often their source of death. 
so you can understand their adulation. But there's always been a secret mystery. Alongside these beautiful paintings, there's often graphical marks, multiple dots, lines and shapes, often ignored because people don't understand that they have any significance. But along came Bennett Bacon. He's an independent science researcher and a furniture restorer from London. And Bennett had an idea about what the dots on the paintings might mean. Now stop, this is dangerous stuff and not how science works. It's all too easy just to have a great idea, do the research, and because of confirmation bias, prove it to yourself. Real scientists do the opposite. They look at a problem by first eliminating all the things that it can't be, leaving maybe only one possibility that is the hidden truth. Because it's potentially lethal to have a good idea and then just do the research to prove it. That doesn't work. But in this case, Bennett's idea turned out to be correct. He postulated that the dots on the marks indicated that ancient humans knew and measured the passage of time. He thought that the dots represented a month. Humans have seen the passage of time for millennia, the moon waxing and waning, indicating each month passing. So Cambridge University Department of Ancient History looked at Bennett's theory and published a paper. They think the dots represent the gestation period of the animal. The ancients knew the month of the mating season and the length of the pregnancy. And often they represented birth with this Y symbol. You can see it's possibly a graphical representation of the act of giving birth. So it seems that our ancestors did count and measure time. And they had a graphical system of dots to communicate the information with other members of their tribe. And I love how nothing really changes, but scroll forward thousands of years to a row between Cambridge scientists and the Swiss. Ernest Rutherford had built this, his gold foil alpha particle experiment at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. He was using it to explore the inner nature of the atom. The current theory was that atoms were meatballs or plum puddings of solid stuff. They're made of bound together subatomic particles. So a lump of gold would just be a plum pudding hugging each other to make a solid gold metal. One of his experiments fired alpha particles through a sheet of solid gold foil. And what he observed is amazing. Over 90% of the alpha particles went right through the gold foil. A tiny number were deflected at an angle and an even tinier number bounced right back. What was going on? Of course you know. It led to the theory that atoms are mainly empty space. A tiny positively charged nucleus attracting negatively charged electrons in a field circling the core. Rutherford said for a positively charged alpha particle to be repelled by a positively charged nucleus of an atom was like shooting a fly in a cathedral. So to prove his results, Rutherford needed to count the collisions. And the only way to do it was to count flashes on an exposed strip of film. This circular strip revealed the luck of the alpha particle in either passing right through or being deflected or the very lucky few bouncing right back. Counting these small flashes on the film was really hard. And the Swiss scientists doubted the accuracy of human counting methods. A big row broke out, delaying Rutherford in publishing his results. So a novel, non-human counting method was required. Enter 
Charles Wynn Williams. CW worked with Rutherford and proposed a hands-off electronic counter that could settle the row. If, in the 1920s, he could build one. Amazingly, the equipment budget of the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge was severely limited. But a generous British vacuum tube manufacturer had donated seven of their new devices called Thyrotrons. Thyrotrons aren't in fact a vacuum tube. Although they look like one, they use a tiny amount of noble gas to make a very fast switch that could be used to make an electronic counter. The next part of this story is one of my favourite parts of human history. Charles Wynn Williams only had seven tubes that were donated by the vacuum tube manufacturing company. It was impossible using seven to build a counter using base 10. So he considered, well, that's okay. I could just use base six or maybe base five. But he had a brilliant idea that would save parts and actually work faster. Why don't I count in base Two, binary code. Less thyrotrons, faster counting. It worked. Because of the Cavendish Laboratory's restricted budget, Charles Wynn Williams invented the world's first binary counting machine. It went on to record all the alpha particle collisions. The Swiss accepted the results because Charles's counter eliminated human error. And the true nature of atomic structure was revealed. The simplicity of the simple on and off binary counting idea became the modern computer silicon chip we have today. Integrated circuits now make millions of printed transistors that replace the vacuum tube thyrotrons first used in Cambridge. So let's get back to Rendlesham Forest. Why would an alien nation contact a human in binary code? A system invented to beat the Swiss, save the Cavendish Laboratory money, and be exploited by IBM to get round the problem of building mechanical base 10 calculating machines. Hey, it's me in the future. <laughs> Come and join me as I uh, feed the sheep. What we can learn from Jim Penistone's experience, and very much from John Burroughs' experience at Randlesham, is really important. Jim's perception of what happened the way that messages were sent inside his head, and John Burroughs' health effects that were initially classified by the US Air Force. Both are enormous clues to reveal the true nature of what really happened at Rendlesham Forest. I'm working with these people and other science researchers to try for the first time to really solve this mystery. I think when we understand what happened at Randlesham, it will open a door that for the first time we can look behind. The truth is out there.